Hello, and welcome to Shape the System, where we find and tell the stories that help people to rethink the way the world works. We interview people from all over the world who are helping to change our systems for the better. Shape the System is an independent podcast with support from KPMG High Growth Ventures, who help ambitious founders and their teams scale up for success. More about KPMG High Growth Ventures after the interview. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Shape the System. Here today with Andrew Walk, who's up on the east coast of the US, I think, at this stage. Is that right, Andrew? That's right. I'm here in Boston. Ah, love it. Working with finding purpose, a common purpose, my apologies. And we were just chatting before the show and I was trying to understand how to land us in the problem space and I'm still not sure how to do it. I think it's somewhere at the intersection of alignment between public and private enterprise and individuals within communities and maybe civic duty to a degree. So I'm just going to hand to you to try and understand exactly what this system is that you're tackling and then we can dive into some of that detail. Sure. Um, It certainly is a just a real pleasure. So thank you. I think that what you're doing is is quite a service to have different people like myself talk about systems and what we're trying to shape. You know, I'd like to, if it's okay, just ask you one question and turn it around <laughs> and just ask you, you know, in Australia right now, if you were to say how you think Australia is measuring success in the 21st century for individuals. What would you What would you come up with? What would you How would you answer that? I mean, I mean, Australia. In my observation of the way the kind of uh, that we're run, I think I say I would say, and I'm trying to avoid the word politically, but how the how the system is run in Australia, a lot of it tries to look at uh, economic measures of prosperity as measures of whether people are doing well. And the understanding is, well, if the economics is good, then the rest of it must be good as well. And there, there, that's that'd be a blunt measure. I'm not coming out of a government policy understanding to really understand it, but my observation was that's sort of how we might measure um, our success in inverted commas. So the way I describe finding common purpose is really considering how we might measure success in the 21st century. Right. across what I would describe as a disparate and siloed set of institutions. Okay. <laughs> and and those institutions, which come in different names, the social sector, the human service sector, the social impact sector, I sometimes refer to it, at least here in the States, as the nonprofit industrial complex, right. is where there are so <laughs> many actors and it's not really clear what success looks like anymore and sure. who's accountable. Sure. Um, we've gotten to the point where part of the game is, can I raise enough money to sustain my own work? Can I right. get reelected? And what actually happens on the ground seems to be less and less important. How is it, for example, in Poughkeepsie, New York, and I'm going to use data here, sure. that 16% of all eighth graders read at math, math proficiency. And right. How is it that in the greater Boston area that more than 50% of families uh, live below a living wage? These are statistics that have actually trended this way for decades now. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we're really trying to uh, build a new social contract between residents and institutions one community dashboard at a time. Right. And so just there's a bunch in here that I'm going to try to go down to. The first thing I just want to do is just touch on what you talked about, the the last part of what you just said, which was, we'll get to the dashboard later, but I'm interested in this concept of the measure of community. Is this bound geographically or is it using the party lines that are traditionally drawn up inside of a council? Like how do you think about community purely in the measuring construct? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm agnostic right now and find what's more important is if there's an existing initiative going on that is interested in going further with what they're doing. And that's what bounds the geography. Here in the United States, there have been actually over the last 10 years quite a large number of what we call place-based initiatives. And they can be bound at the neighborhood level Mm -hmm. through networks like purpose-built communities. They can be bound by the county level, by networks like By All Means and Strive Together. What's bounding them is that some residents as well as private nonprofit and public sectors have come together to try to make change. 
The only thing I want to say, though, is what makes that question really challenging is the resource flow. Sure. <laughs> resource flow generally at, is at its largest at the federal level and begins to trickle down and more and and the smaller trickles down to the least power communities have and how to spend it. Right. So the neighborhood might be the best place to start, but they have the least amount of power on what to do with the resources they have. Well, and the least amount of resources to apply to the problems that they have within their grasp, I'm guessing, is part of that. That's exactly right. Yeah. Right. And then typically, what is that like in, in I'm, I guess what I, the parallel I'm trying to make here is something like the Dunbar's number, right? Where you can only really meaningfully know 150 people or thereabouts. And a part of what we think about as a community may be a reflection of how villages used to self organize and, and the size of that may be some, some kind of innate part of societally how we actually function. And I wonder whether at a, at a, to try to frame what size of community makes sense there probably is some kind of boundary to that, at least an upper boundary, certainly. Did you, in what your, some of the examples you just gave then, you were talking about a certain district within, potentially within Boston or within a larger kind of region within it. Do you think there is an optimal size where the type of stuff you're doing, which we'll talk about in a sec, is actually going to operate at? It's a great question, and I don't think I have a great answer yet. Sure. Because of the way, <laughs> because of the way I'm beginning to operate in the space, and I'm sure we'll cover this later, but finding common purpose is relatively new after spending 17 years um, starting and running the cause a nonprofit consulting firm and and Mm -hmm. spinning off a couple of nonprofits. My gut tells me it's at the neighborhood level because of something you said. I think it's larger than 150 because that (laughs) probably is larger than a neighborhood that is able to create enough power and, and institutional and resident alignment. Um, right. Neighborhoods can be large though. So, you know, if I had to guess, I was on the phone with people from something called Purpose Built Communities, you know, in that 15,000 person right. range might make sense, but they're still going to be connected to a city and the city's going to connect it to a county and then we've got right. city council members and that's where it just gets so complicated. Yeah. But it's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I mean, I think as much as, and neighborhood, by the way, is a term in the US that is typically denoting like a suburb, like a mission, or I'm thinking of a San Francisco example, like where I was. And just, just sort of broadening that out for people, it's kind of an area where there's a bit of a fairly, uh, you could say a shared identity. It's a bunch of people who tell you where they live, right? And they don't tell you I live in Boston, they tell you which part of Boston they live in, for example. And I'm guessing that this level of shared identity in some way flows into this kind of alignment and organisation that these community dashboards do. Let's let's talk a little bit about the types of participants who are typically coming into this dashboard product that, that we will talk about a bit later on. Yeah, I mean, basically, it's it's who you would imagine, right? right. Although the most important stakeholder could be more at the table than they have, which is the actual members of that community itself. Right. Um, what you've seen over time, which has been terrific in some of this place-based work, is that cross sector of public institutions, nonprofit on the ground service organizations, businesses and business leaders, particularly large corporations, sure. um, and then philanthropy, where, where right. which is quite large here, coming to the table to try to align both their resources and their actions towards a unified set of outcomes. Um, right. And where I've seen it working best is where those dialogues are happening first to see where they may want to go. But those right, see where the problems are within that community yeah. or the things that are important to that community, for example. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. right. Yep. Okay. And like, just, I'm trying to, um, I guess I'm trying to understand, <laughs> it might sound like a silly question and I'm going to ask yeah. a lot of those. <laughs> Half the fun of being able to do your own thing. Uh, <laughs> well, like it seems fundamental to me that if you've got a group of non-profits and government organisations and civic, you know, organisations and individuals and private enterprise that are all operating within and or servicing a community, that they would need to be aligned for in what it is that they're trying to achieve broadly, even if they're working on different things. Why doesn't this already exist as part of the framework of how these companies and these ventures and these entities operate? Yeah, I think the incentives are unfortunately not aligned at this point in time. I was just sort of run through, and I I meant to mention school districts, which are all critical to the table, of course. Yep, sure. The incentives are just not, not lined up. So the politician is looking for re-election, so short-term. Right. So there's no real 
advantage for them to get really clear on a particular measure and where they want to take that over a mm-hmm. short period of time. Mm-hmm. And it's not even a short period of time. It'll take a longer period of time, right? Sure. So if you're going to move third grade reading proficiency up by 7%, that might take more than the length of term of a politician. Um, right. Philanthropy, at least in our country, is really not bound by any accountability. And so what you have is large numbers of change makers who use their private resources to decide what they want to work on. Right. And so they don't have much incentive to really come to the table. Right. The local nonprofit service providers are operating in such a scarce resource environment that they really have to sustain their own work to just serve the people they do. So they are right. working with, you know, trying to make ends meet while, you know, asking someone to come to the table without getting paid to do it can be really hard. So the those ver- government agencies, the people who run and allocate, they 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 could be, you know, have their hand slapped and maybe lose their job in some way. So the incentives right. are not there as much as you think that they would be. Um, and, that right. becomes- and so, in in some respects, just the reading into this a little bit is that they're not only they're incentivized differently, but they're they're almost chasing, I would say, different goals, and not necessarily on a purposeful way, but they're all operating within their own sphere of how they understand the world works or what they think is important in their own world. And I'm guessing the F4 is, are, there's a whole lot of people and actors operating at cross purposes, perhaps none of them in alignment with what the stakeholders in that community being the community itself would actually want. Is that that part of the rubber that? I think that is part of the rubber, although I would say that in the category of what the people want, that becomes the final sort of challenge around right. um because they, they have over time been asked. It's not clear that people are listening. Right. But, but they also may not know because they're trying so hard just to make ends meet, put food on right. the table, get transportation, right. work such busy lives that they don't necessarily know what they don't know um, about what may be most important in terms of how to land themselves a decent job or take advantage of certain services or so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So I think what you said actually prior to that of different groups operating with different points of view on what they think are most important from an institutional perspective makes it right. makes it challenging for them to want to come together. Right. At least in our country, third grade reading proficiency has been known for a very long time is a huge predictor for both completing high school to be ready for college and moving on for a decent paying job. Right. And yet the numbers have stayed for particular populations and different areas relatively flat for literally decades now. Right. And so we have to sort of ask yourself why we can't, why we can't align around something like that. Yeah. I was, well, I was going to, I mean, not to speak, I know you're using that just as an example in the broader context, but just to, to narrow in on that, like if you look at that particular example is, is the root cause of this uh, relating to the fact that, that, no one's taken accountability for it, or there isn't an alignment around how you solve this problem? So um, I don't think it's been put in front of people as something to really talk about. Right. That, I, I think that that's that would be, and, and I think when you really talk about it, you're going to get very uncomfortable about it. Right. You're going to make people uncomfortable, or it is uncomfortable to talk it's about gonna, you're, It's going to make people feel really uncomfortable. Right. You know, I, I think the two things that are going to come up that are going to make the actors uncomfortable is race Um, because at least in in our country, you're going to then find that the disparities are mostly stark based on race. So for example, in Kent County, Michigan, the Lowell area school district is 69% reading at third grade reading proficiency and it's 99% white. And the school district right next door, another neighborhood is at 28%, but 60% are reading proficiency or white, but only 23% Hispanic and 60% black. Right. So if you were to ha- rally all of these institutions around the table to talk about that, the first thing you're going to have to talk about is race. Right. The right. second thing you're going to have to talk about is, well, who's accountable for how this happened? Right. It's going to make everyone really uncomfortable, right? Because the school district's going to, someone's going to point his school district hasn't been doing their job, but the right. one is going to point their job that no one has childcare, and another one is going to point the finger that the service providers who are supposedly tutoring and so you're going to have a finger pointing thing as well. And so it right. becomes, you know, really uncomfortable conversations when you pick something and say you're going to do something about it. And and so just sort of shifting gears a little bit into 
what role a community dashboard play. I want to talk about the outcome of them in a minute, but I but I actually kind of want to understand like the role they play in in I guess either facilitating or even starting those kinds of conversations. Like what what is being brought together in that dashboard that then enables a different type of dialogue to be happening between these stakeholders? So the way that I've studied it um, and, and, and hope to begin to produce some, some open source case studies and tools for people is to not start with where you think things are going, but at least have a foundation of where you hope they're going. And what I mean right. by that is, is with two important constructs. The first construct is that we actually operate life in some level of a continuum from the time that we're born to the time that we die. I call it the cradle to end of life continuum. That there's some there's some continuum that's happening across a course of life that we should pay more attention to that should hit certain milestones. Sure. And then the other sunk at fundamental premise is that I think we need to take a second look at really how important meeting basic needs is in order to actually move along that continuum. That if you are having trouble being fed or have a a roof over your head, that it's really hard to make that progress, right? Right. And so framing the conversation in that way is what I think becomes most important. And then bringing stakeholders together, and most importantly, residents, with that kind of framing and some sort of introduction to measures that might be the right ones, right? Right, um, not, right. not trying to push them in the direction that they are the right ones, but based on a couple of um, really important pre- premises, is which what is there some evidence out there that this measure might be a proxy for something? Because there's no perfect measure, right? Sure. And then public data is the second one. And I think the right. public data one, I think, is often not utilized well enough. And that we often want the perfect measure, which the perfect measure comes with all sorts of challenges if you have to privately measure it. Uh, <laughs> and, and all sort of influence, I'm guessing. It's kind of hard to sit arbitrarily outside and objectively outside of this stuff. And I think know, that's and right. especially, yeah. Yeah. And, and so you've got the arbitrariness of it. You've got whether the tools are out there. You've got to raise the resources to privately put it together. So I am a big fan in trying to really work with what we have right now. It may not be perfect, um, but at least it allows us to say, well, if this public measure is, is good and there's evidence, maybe it's not being disaggregated as much as it should be by race or neighborhood right. level, but maybe we can go and expand upon it in some way. Interesting. So I want to I want to come back to a few of the things in this. So you talked about this continuum, and and I'm guessing that there's there's kind of a commonality of these are the types of things that you need at a baseline to be able to be pros- to prosper right, or to thrive or whatever the kind of overarching term is. Um, but the, at different stages in an individual's life, as part of a community, but just measuring the individual here, certain things are more important to them at 13 to 19 versus 19 to 29. That's right. um, and I think from from my read of it earlier, there was a, there's about six major stages that you have in this continuum. Is that right? Have I got That's the right. number right? Yep. Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> uh, yep. t- just talk me through these continuum stages. And I, and I'm curious as to how this kind of came out, this idea that, You've got to understand that the, the the needs of a 58-year-old in the community and the needs of a 15-year-old in the community are different and you need to service them differently and here's how we've thought about these stages. Yeah, well, first let me say it's not mine. I've, there, there have been <laughs> others well before me. Uh, mine might have six and others had four or seven or whatever, but I think the Brookings Institute had something called the Social Genome Project, these places right. all across the country have had cradle to careers. Right. Um, I, I do think that oftentimes... They have stopped after college and not really taken into account what happens once you get into the workforce, which actually sure. is the most important time, and certainly you know what happens after you're out of the workforce. But the just real quick, without taking all our time, no, that period of time prenatally, you know, when, when a woman is pregnant to ensure a healthy birth till they're ready for actually entering the formal education system mm-hmm. is one period of time and actually ironically we now know maybe the most important time and actually has probably the least formal system of measures in place at least in our country right now that's changing quite a bit i think there's been a lot of energy around the importance of pre-k and zero to 18 months but it's still it's probably at its earliest 
Then the second stage is that sort of more formal post primary and secondary education. So when you were in formal K through 12 education, at least here, Mm -hmm. that gets divided out often between sort of, you know, middle school here, at least, you know, K through entering high school and then high school. But in the confines of that system, oftentimes people will move that into post-secondary. I do not. I I think that the formal education system is very formal in the way it's set up here. So that becomes a second stage. And then the third stage becomes that entering the workforce stage, right? So, you know, I think there's more pressure put on a college degree being important than what happens when you go out of high school. And and while a college degree can be essential, there are many training and vocational institutions and so on and so forth. But what are we really trying to accomplish, which is to try to enter someone into some sort of pathway for them to um, be able to have some sort of living wage. So that right. stage of life of post-secondary into some sort of decent paying job is that third. And then the, and then the fourth one is and once you've um, gone there is how well are you building your assets? you know, into the workforce to some level of sort of stability right. uh, that, that you have. From there, you're now moving from building assets to a stability that has you enter that final stage of life. And those two can be a bit gray. And, and I've thought about them a lot and they may need to get molded together because we have probably spent the least amount of time to get to my question I right. asked you at the beginning around economic indicator. Sure which is that we focus primarily on employment right. as opposed to wage. And I think wage would be a better indicator. So I don't think we've studied enough what that period of time looks like. It's kind of like you're just kind of out there. And right. you know, how do you build the assets? <laughs> just keep doing whatever it was that you were doing. <laughs> exactly. So that you get to the last stage, which is with healthy aging, you know, towards the end of your life, where it's kind of the wild, wild west right now, you know? Right push them into a nursing home? Do they have enough for social security here? And if we paid a little bit more attention perhaps to that stage of, of security, that maybe, you know, that this, this boom of seniors are coming, we'd have a better idea of how to, how to understand how to care for that in some way. Right. And also how a community provides for people who That's are right. at that stage, you know, and, and some of it might be a discrete measure like are they going to have enough money to survive? But also, what's the quality of living in the community that they're, that they're now living in? I mean, most people, I'm guessing, over the age of 55 or 60, aren't picking up and moving every eight years. They're probably a little more stayed in where they're living versus someone in their 20s. Yeah, um, one of the key indicators that's emerging, because it's ironic that those, the tail ends of that continuum are where the indicators are least clearly known or looked right. at right now. One of them has come up is, is aging in place right. as a way to sort of really give people their greatest level of comfort and then not have to afford a nursing home or so on and so forth. But, but I think what you said is exactly right. Um, not clear how much those measures are looked at. And I want to come to measures because that was the second thing you talked about. You talked about continuum and these sort of six major stages in this measure of it. But the, I think a lot of the challenge with measures is, and we'll, we'll sort of hark back to the third year reading example, by definition is a trailing indicator, right? And it's hard to fix things by looking at the wake of the boat, right? You kind of have to look at where the boat's going, and and or, or you know, like how like is there is there a body of uh, like knowledge or research or that even if it's still emerging that sort of says if this is the outcomes that you want for your society, these are the things you actually need to be looking at and working through, and and is this part of the disconnect for a community who, as it has inevitably said, we do want to be aligned. But we're not really sure what to be looking at and what to be measuring to, to what outcome. Is that part of the the other half of this debate dashboard? I think that's exactly right. I, I what I've tried to say, look, there are lots of dashboards out there. Right. <laughs> and there are, you know, countless websites that you can go to that have data. Kids count by the Andy Casey Foundation is a terrific one. Right. Um, it's more the, the the process selection and what you do with it. So so I like to say that it can be a North Star that aligns residents and stakeholders, right? That commits to particular measures to reduce disparities. And if you do that, then it can be used to inform policy and resource decisions, service gaps, and reinforce alignment and accountability. So there are plenty of them that sit on the shelf and we know the data and we keep repeating the data. Right. Um, But I think that it's the way that they get used is really what I'm trying to advocate for that can be a lot more public. I I would love a day where, you know, you're walking down the street in a given community and 
a resident or someone running a school district would know a particular measure on where they were hoping it would go in the next five years in their community. That it would be put in the local newspaper, you know, on a particular page consistently and news was reported on it every day. Um, not unlike the way you see the COVID tracker, right, today. Right. Over the place, right? <laughs> or the sports scores. Or the sports scores. <laughs> right. So why can't we do the same for what we have decided? And I am not saying that there's a perfect measure. I know. A group that, that I worked with in Kent County said there are no perfect measures. There are only proxies for, for predicting what the future will look like. Right. Uh, but we find ourselves that when we pick something, it does force some level of alignment. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, the kind of the common refrain, I think, normally, you know, here, I think it's more a gym rat turn to be anything else. But they taught you if you measure it, you you know, you can improve it. That's right. Now, I'd much prefer that we're aligned and measuring things and improving it and find out that we're improving the wrong thing than kind of all shooting off in different directions and not seeing progress at all. I think that's right. I just, I'm curious, coming back to to this, some of the measures. I'm also curious about some of the stakeholders. We want to get back to that. Just in terms of the measure, is Part of what makes, um, and I'm thinking about some of the stuff I've done in personal finance where you have a, a section of the society who wants to track their money and what they need is tooling to do it easily. But then you have a whole bunch of people who actually don't want to track it. And the method through which you engage a lot of those people is say, the motivation for you tracking it is actually to see how you're doing against others. And benchmarking is more important to those people than kind of a self kind of awareness kind of a part of the equation. It's part of what makes some of these things work is understanding, especially for, even for leading indicators, not for the trailing indicators, here's how you're doing versus another neighbourhood or another community who has been measuring this stuff for a while. Yeah, it's a great question that I'm just struggling right now with with the community I'm working with. Right. I think comparisons are critical. And I think, you know, recognising that particularly the way resources flow that comparing one neighborhood next to another, like I described, can can just can define sort of where resources are allocated. At the same time, I think measures of comparison often pit people against each other where people who have may not be as interested in giving up what they have. Right. And and I think there's a challenge to that, as opposed to maybe we should be thinking about where we all should be at. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean by that is, and I gave that example of Poughkeepsie, where if overall, actually, let me take that back. I think it was in Portland, Maine. If we, sure. if we, if we look at you know a percentage of third graders that are reading and 70% and is the highest in the county, right. and 16% is the lowest in the county, and maybe the average is 50%, well, maybe we're just trying to strive to get everyone to the average. Right. 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 And, and say that that's what we're looking for. And I, and I think where we've lost our way is we've gotten into this comparison and me versus them. And well, you're right. going to speak for me. And so I may lose something. Right. Opposed to sort of so societally. And what I like to use as my example of this is that unemployment or full employment, I don't know what it is in Australia, is yeah. like 4.9% or something. Right. Sure. And that's sort Roughly of like. The same. Yeah, roughly like what we want to get to, right? So if we just pick some of these proxy measures, say, this is where we should be at. Like everyone should be at least here. Right. Um, then that would not. Then when that would force these comparisons, which unfortunately create some some animosity because people think, well, you're taking from me, so my numbers may go down, so your numbers go up. <laughs> I'm I'm understanding the point, but I'm going to play it back to you. I yeah. I was um I wouldn't say it was problematic at school, but I certainly kind of understood the way the normal curve worked when we had maths classes and I used to be a little disruptive because I was okay at maths so I didn't I could get through the class okay and I would disrupt the class and when the teacher hit me up about it she's like this makes other students worse and I said well by comparison that will make my grades better and she was very, ups <laughs> very upset by this I was like I get it but please don't do that to my class <laughs> I'm trying to trying to lift the thing but that's probably that's a more that's serious that's note yeah I mean we've just that's had that's the Olympics right and um it's interesting when you watch the, the commentators of the Olympics, and, you, and I'm sure this is happening in other countries as well. Pretty much every country has somehow worked out how to be on top of the medal table based on the subjective view of how their medals are important in the context of a measure they're able to win at. And I think yeah. actually yeah. brilliant who's like writes these cartoons in Santa Barbara 
He talks about the secret to winning is to invent your own game and tell no one else the rules. Yep. And I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel a lot of the time when you have benchmarks, they're used to find a way to make the thing you're doing fine and to make you on top because that's what people want to feel. But you kind of need to have, you know, arbitrary, not arbitrary, but but sub- objective and separate measures that say that's what, a, to your point, True North looks like. And in, in saying that, are you able to, you know, you just used the example of employment and maybe that's one of these critical measures and that's a, a trailing one, obviously. Do, do you, in terms of trying to build these dashboards and give communities um, some measures that they should be thinking about, whether leading or trailing, do you, I mean, where where might you find that stuff? Are you looking at best cases in other in communities or places overseas, or like how do you land on some of these measures? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, the reality is 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 a large majority of the work is already out there for people, and oftentimes it's things that people already knew were out there. I mean, I can only speak here, right? So, sure. so you know, in that first stage, you know, we have a kindergarten readiness measure, and we have tools. There are a few different ones, but you know, more and more states are adopting them across the country. In the, you know, in, in the health area, you know, obesity is widely being measured now across our country. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Reading and math proficiencies is widely measured. We are getting better, although it's not as public as we like around o- the wage measure or income measure, right? Sure. In, you know, in different areas. So, so they're more accessible. I, I think what's more not happening is people using that public data framing it correctly for communities to want to rally around and putting it forth for them to talk about. Right. I think the other thing that gets tripped up, which I don't have a great answer to, is that you know we've divided not just that continuum, but into two sort of categories of education leading to some sort of economic mobility right. and, and health, right? Both social, mm-hmm. emotional, and physical health. And, and we're pretty weak on measures around social and emotional health. I think it's only emerging as a critical aspect to your ability to sort of function and be in school and, and you know, be able to be in class and so on and so forth. So we're pretty limited, and I think there's going to have to be probably some investment at the public sector level for that type of stuff. So we're going to have to use some proxies right now in some way. But it's more available than you would realize and more about how one brings communities together to think about them is, and, and work together on them. And I think you know, sort of using that as a good dovetail to the actual dashboard itself, part of this is about saying it is all out there. If you wanted to, if you were, you know, really kind of forward thinking or, you know, a 90 hours a week kind of operator within a community or in a nonprofit or whichever part of that fabric that you exist in, you could probably pull all this stuff together. But part of this in the world that we live in now is where you can build software that enables a lot of that to come together and 90% of that heavy lifting can be done. And yes, there's going to be nuance between different communities and what they should be focused on. The indicators are important, but you're bringing a dashboard to a set of stakeholders that says this thing's already 90% done. You just have to start getting in and making it your own. Is that kind of where the product, I'm kind of making air quotes when I say that, yeah. but the product plays? Is that what's happening? Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I'm not looking at it from a productization perspective. It's it's sure. more of a facilitative tool. So I think that, I think that top down approach won't work. Right. So so the so the hypothesis and there are some examples, you know, of where it has been a more top down. Here are the measures, take this inter- intermediary. Go for it. <laughs> you know, I think it's more finding the trusted leaders in a community that want to, with some back guidance, facilitate talking about that they would want something like this. So by the end of it, they've got something that they built on their own, right? So it's not. So the shaping and framing of it, as I said earlier, of, you know, perhaps it's in this continuum form, or maybe it's that you just want a couple of measures in financial health, leading a healthy life and education, right? So maybe they right. want to bag the whole continuum piece and just right. make it simplistic. Right. But more importantly, over it could be six, nine months, even 12, bringing those key institutions and residents together to talk about it themselves and think about where it would live and how it would be used is going to be far more important than me or the dashboard. Up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's interesting and because I misunderstood that when I was first like reading about it and trying to understand it. Yeah. Um, and I think – For me to know, by the way. <laughs> Good. Um, well, I mean, we tend to gravitate to the tangible thing that we can point at, right? And this yep. is part of the challenge with software is that it's quite esoteric. 
You know, there's no one who's like, oh, my God, you see that beautiful bit of software? Like software people do that, but most people are like, what is it doing for me? And I want to sort of get back to the PFM budgeting example that I gave, which is there's amazing technology out there to help people track their money, but the most successful programs I've observed over a five-year period are the ones that help people change their behaviour and the technology is kind of the tool to help them do that. And it's usually people helping people change behaviour and the technology is kind of here's your thing to continue this behaviour that we've just established. Is this kind of the model that is what you're bringing in? A hundred percent. And so I'm just taking that a hundred percent. That's exactly right. So I do not add, I am not advocating that I have some silver bullet tool but I am advocating for a process for which there would be a tool that I think could be helpful for the process that we're in and that they would want to move forward with over time. Yeah. And that's going to ruffle feathers getting all those people together to talk about it. It <laughs> will be the process itself that I think is most important. Well, I mean, and this kind of leads me to a few of the questions here, which is, I mean, it, it having a, an amazing process is good. And if you, you know, even even momentarily jump on Facebook, you'll see the number of ads for processes that will help you get more flexible and more fit and more whatever it is. But so many of them are now services that are facilitation of taking the action. And the framework is just something that helps someone sell an idea and attach their authentic, you know, ability to deliver on the program. And so it sounds to me like part of that is this, which we've brought all these assets together and we've brought it into a process and we can facilitate that for you. So I guess two main questions I have for that is, how do you facilitate it? As in, like, and and I guess rela- a related question is if is how do you scale it? You yeah. know, like if it requires you to be there or a version of you to be there, then and this can't necessarily be done by the community themselves, and it takes to your point nine to twelve months. How do you roll this thing out? So I'll give you the premise around it. So so the premise is by bringing some of the key leaders together, and it could be in a small group or a large group that then want to drive what would be called community conversations over a period of time and they would decide how many they want to do who comes to the table but having a good cross section of residents and institutions where there's a good structured conversation around that would lead towards they all know that ultimately this is to lead towards they would establish some sort of dashboard that they could do something with right. so the community conversations you know using that generic term is really the process Right. So the scalability of it is a really good question. I think the only thing that I can say is that my hope is to build, so, so coming from a consulting background, sure. root cause, I think what, what, what we did not do enough of that is, is give away what we do. Right. And, and the reason we don't give away what we do is because we need some sort of proprietary knowledge to keep ourselves in mm-hmm. business which was sure. why I, I left doing what I was doing. So my hope is, is that there becomes a shared community of open access to this type of work where right. ultimately um, everyone is willing to share the tools that have been built, the way it's been done. There's a peer aspect to it where one person can call another. That is not going to limit the expertise that is always going to be needed in some way. Sure. But maybe it will lower the bar a bit to, you know, five and six. Or broaden the net. Costs. Yeah, or broaden the net of how how many people could do this on their own. I think that's going to take time as well as, you know, people wanting to contribute both their own time to share what they've been doing and be able to get their tools from different people. But, you know, as an example, I am working with a community to interview them on how they ran these community conversations. And they're more than happy to share their community conversation toolkit and how they made a public announcement about it. So it's not as much a case study as as a click here and get their toolkit already, right? It's a playbook. (laughs) It's a playbook, right? And I don't even want to say the playbook, but it's more very framework in some way. Yeah, yeah. So that's... I mean, and yeah, so just, I mean, the it it sounds to me like the, the, the change that's required to even move a community in this direction firstly requires bringing a bunch of people to the table, right, which probably means operating within that community to know the people to bring to the table and have a degree of gravitas to bring them to the table and then facilitating, to your point, a bunch of conversations that say this is, we need to agree that this, this this concept is important and then think about how we want to make the concept our own. And that's all very human behavior that's not technology it's not platform and the framework is really just to your point of facilitation tool do you think assuming that that 
the, the, the genesis of this and the very early stage of this is, is very centred on the delivery of, and for, of a facilitation that it lends itself to a certain type of individual who will think a certain way or operate a certain way? Yeah, I mean, the individual has to have the skill sets of really strong listening skills, holding the frame while willing to enter new aspects of that frame to broaden it but not get rid of it, right? Right. Um, and that, that really becomes the core because as I think you said earlier, each of these institutions or residents are going to bring a little bit of a different frame to this or hold on to their own point of view or quite frankly, their own power in some way. So how do you <laughs> hold the frame while listening and sort of having to expand or make it nimble in some way? And I think that is a very particular skill set. And, and I think you've hit the nail on the head that I think we're trying to understand who those right people might be in the community. I like to say that I like I would like to lead from behind and never in front of the community because I'm not from that community. But how we sure. find those people is hard. And the more they're from the people that they're actually, you know, bringing together is difficult. Yeah. And look, I mean, I'm always uh, at risk of going into solution mode when I hear about problems. Ooh. Half the fun of talking about them. But I mean, so much of this reminds me of kind of things like the way yoga works as an example, mm. right, where you've got people who learn how to do the craft and they want to run a yoga studio a certain way, but the, firstly they need to have the credential that says you know how yoga works, you know, and I've only done a small amount of yoga. I'm not a practitioner. I'm not someone who knows how to teach it. But my observation of yoga is that there's some, a bunch of fundamentals that everyone agree has agreed are important and people go and learn those fundamentals and then they go back into their own community and set up a studio in their own likeness, which is how they want their studio to operate, but attached to those fundamentals. And it's there's a set of principles that are kind of apply that help someone guide what is or isn't yoga, but but the personalization and what what's relevant and needed for that community and how they want to operate that studio is related to what they're trying to do, but also the, the people who they're trying to serve in the community that they're around. And it feels to me like the model here, I mean, if, my guess is there's probably 50,000 local communities in, the new, in the, you know, North America. Probably, I don't even know if that number's even in the right decile. So to, to actually scale this challenge, you're going to have to empower tens of thousands of people to understand a program, to understand it well enough to then go and make it their own inside their own community. Is that kind of yeah, I th- three I steps th- ahead? Or? Yeah, no, no. I think your yoga analogy is a great one. I think that it does go back to I'm not, I'm not clear yet on what the the center of change is, neighborhood. Right. I mean, my gut tells me it's neighborhood in some way. It's going to have to roll up to some degrees up. You know, I, I did write an op-ed about a month ago in a, in a place called Changing America where, you know, if we had a national community dashboard, you know, right. that, that, that trickled down to communities, that would be ultimately what would be great, right? right. So I think we have to take a bottom up approach here. So, but I think either way, you're right. It, 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 we, we need empowered local people to do it. And I think that's a, I think your analogy is, is quite good. I will say, because it was one thing you had put in front of me before, before we talked to each other, that I want to, the, the biggest bottleneck here, unfortunately, in the long run is, is going to be elected politicians. Right. And, and the reason why that is, is that they do, they do hold a fairly large amount of power to pick the issues that are most important, allocate resources. And that doesn't have to be, that can be all the way down to city council or county. I was going to say, even at that level of community. It really is, yeah. And and they are the least interested in this. Right. <laughs> that was actually one of my questions from earlier. Who, who's already at the table and who are you having to bring drag kicking and screaming and, and politicians are at the far end of that level? They are. Well, and, and they're not always at the far end if you can hold cover for them. Right. But, but they're, they're at the far end of the table for good reason because, you know, you know, they, they may actually be trying to do good, but, you know, the, the media is going to crucify them if they go public with what they say they're going to accomplish or they're putting out this right. fire. You know, right. that's what I've heard right. by elected mayors in some way. So it's, it's a tricky balance of why there, there's very little incentive for them to be at the table. And I've heard a story you know, in a place I will not mention where, you know, a government agency had put there together a dashboard like this where it showed sure. that, you know, change hadn't happened in a while and still wasn't happening and the governor of that state just shut down the dashboard, right? 
I laugh, but I'm not actually that surprised. <laughs> yeah. So I think you know, I think that's the biggest challenge is how to give some of the people whose job may be most in the line some cover mm. while this stuff starts to take shape in some ways. It's going to be a really important nuance to how this politically plays out in a given community. Yeah, I look. You know, I mean, I, my main kind of venture thing, I guess, is a online mortgage broking, and and we found that transparency is is like incredibly critical for for developing trust. And if you can normalize the idea that hey, we just put everything out there and everyone can see it, and that's our starting position, then you you do, you have a different kind of engagement that happens within a group of people because they're like, well, now everything else that you say is resonating differently because you've your starting point was it's all here. Our job's not to hide it from you. Our job is to help you with it. So if at least you can see it and we can see it and we're both looking at the same thing, at least now we're not talking about different things. I mean, there's examples, I think, in Finland or Norway where tax returns are a public asset, like everyone's tax return is publicly available. Yeah. Like how would that change behavior? <laughs> if- <laughs> I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the only challenge is some of this data – you know, it may not be packaged out there, but it's correct. But there doesn't seem any ramifications to the fact that the data keeps staying the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that is sort of, you know, and that's the one I can't quite put my finger on is it doesn't seem to matter much, right? If that right. some of those data points I share with you are been the same for 20 or 30 years. So, right. so there doesn't seem yeah. to be the same level of sort of, and some of the, the data you just mentioned, right, is more of a personal indicator that gives me an individual empowerment that I want to have. Right. Right versus a collective one. So just, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the time, if you've got a data point that's staying the same, then people obviously aren't focused on the thing that led to that data point. That's right. But a lot of the time, that's, those things are obviously related. You talk right up front about incentive structures. If the incentives were to change that data point, that data point would change. That's right. That's right. So that's you know, sometimes you have to shine a light on it to make it to make it important. You're, you, you've mentioned a couple of times root cause, and you, you've been that for 18 years, and then that led to, to this in, in a more recent time. Talk me through this shift from almost 22 decades in this to, to, to throwing it all through here to, to what you're doing now. Like, how did that arc of that story land? Yeah. Um, well, still landing by the sound of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it really happened. You know, we started as a strategy consulting firm focused on business planning, my, primarily for nonprofits, and I... So. Moved, moved to measurement as a key area. And we were fortunate to do some work now 10 years ago on black male achievement. And it was at that time that I introduced a, a, a black male achievement dashboard. And so it forced me to understand public data sources. And when I saw the data, which in Detroit, 4% of black boys were reading it at third grade reading proficiency and that number had stayed the same for 20 years. It just sort of blew right. me away. Right. And over that period of time, the job just felt like a job. Um, and I knew right. the that, consulting job, I knew that we were doing good work. Right. I knew that, that I was writing good plans or setting up good things and helping get more resources. But in the aggregate, it didn't feel, I, I was great at, getting articles published, speaking in places, getting foundation money, right. you know, all the things that you know, <laughs> you know that you can do, but it didn't feel like it was enough anymore. Mm. And so, but I was fortunate because we cause is not, you know, a huge, you know, we, well, I've spun off a couple of programs. So at our height, maybe we were 35 people. When I left last October, I think we were 18 or 20, had a really solid number two I had brought in two or three years ago. So the time really felt Right. Right. Also, a white male in his fifties, in you know, leading in this kind of work is probably something that needs to move on as well. So the timing just felt right to try to broaden my thinking and see if I can add value without, I guess, taking from the sector at the same time. So that that's that's the short story of it. <laughs> I, I mean, there's, I'm curious because there's somewhat of an irony that you probably had a measure that sat the same for about ten years that you weren't happy with at a personal level that triggered you to realize that there was a whole bunch of societal measures that were staying the same and that you needed to go and leave what you were doing and had been doing comfortably but stably for the last 10 years to try and shift the dial on something sure, else. right. I mean, you know, yeah, absolutely. Making sure <laughs> that we earn more than we didn't have so I could make payroll, you know, how many articles I got published or speaking yeah, 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 yeah. I had. or you know, Absolutely. I had a very different scoreboard, that's for sure. And I'm trying my best to 
have a scoreboard, which is to try to help others sort of realize community change. Um, mm. Level of my, you know, a couple of decades of experience now is right. I think that's, a, I think that's an excellent point. <laughs> and then like where you find yourself like, like right now today, um, having spent, you know, a little bit of time in the, in the finding common purpose sort of with focus, like what's, you know, what's the main thing that's holding back what it is that you're, the ultimate aim that you're trying to see and what you're tackling is a huge, huge challenge. And obviously you're not the only person tackling it, but like what's the biggest, biggest constraint at the moment with 10 xing what it is that you're able to deliver or achieve for the people you're delivering it to? Yeah, I mean, it's a great, I, I think the irony of that question is my own time where I think it sounds like you started and built and are continuing to build a lot of things and you know as a social entrepreneur who has built a bunch of stuff it takes a lot of time i think i want more balance you know and so i think you know trying to pick how i allocate my time knowing you know i could move a lot faster is probably the biggest sort of bottleneck i would say um to to just be patient and say this is my last journey and let it just let itself play out is probably what I would say is the biggest bottleneck. Like I could give you obvious answers like <laughs> when I start to raise resources more than I have or yeah, yeah. You know, getting particular groups on board that I think I'd love to have on board. But I've started enough things to feel that's not it anymore. I think it's more taking a measured work at the speed of time that feels like I'm building trust and making things happen, which will just sort of hopefully take time is probably how I, I, I would answer it. Um, if it doesn't move as fast as it should, that would probably be the bottleneck that, 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 that <laughs> yeah. It's a very really look, laconic answer. I just, not I feel like a uh, hundred hour weeks. Uh, yeah. I just, look, <laughs> often that's not, not the solution either. I think a lot yeah. of the time, you know, I was talking to someone the other day about, um, Yelp and it's an unobvious segue, but, but I'll work back to it. And, when Yelp launched in whatever it was, 2007, 2008, around that time, it wasn't obviously wasn't the first place where you could go and review a restaurant, but it was the one that arrived when smartphones became into the popular lexicon. In the US, the iPhone launched in 2007, I think it was. And so the idea was, was always right, which is people want to share with other people that this restaurant was no good or this one was great, whatever the, the thing is. But then there was a a time in which that suddenly became possible and important and and everyone suddenly moved on that. And I think a lot of what people do who are change makers is they, they're they obviously urgent to get what it is into the world that they're trying to do, not perhaps acknowledging that sometimes you actually need to wait for the idea's time to come yeah. and for the conditions for that idea to exist. And I, I think that's why I sort of talked a little bit about um, some of the things that you're doing, which is the dashboard is clearly an asset you can point to and it's a framework and even you were the first to say there's lots of frameworks, right? But this idea that that we have to start thinking about the uh, outcomes and the needs of society more broadly than just GDP at the national level, okay, that, that idea, if you talk to people 30 years ago at a community, they wouldn't have known what you were talking about, I'm guessing. And you can actually probably have that conversation now. The idea that you can use data and there's publicly available sources of data and you can weave them into something that someone can actually interpret or at least take as a starting point, there seems to be a bunch of macros that are arriving. Maybe they haven't arrived, but maybe they're arriving. And your time to execute in this starts with in realising that you, if you're going to be in the right place at the right time, sometimes you have to be at the right place and wait a while. <laughs> I think that is sage advice for me, Vincent, I got to say. <laughs> that's going to that's gonna have me take my zen and go do some yoga and just sort of take it one day at a time, which, which I just, I love, I think that's great. I, I, you know, from your, your mouth to, to my brain, I hope I can hold <laughs> my brain. That's terrific. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Well, we, we could probably keep talking for a while and we probably will talk more because I'm curious to learn more about the product uh, and, and the, not the product's the wrong word, but, but everything that you're doing to facilitate these outcomes. I, I know you've got quite a US centric view of the world, but I think communities the world over can always strive to be better versions of themselves. And so I think if there's people listening who are interested in what it is that you're doing who might have another lens or an aspect that might be useful, I'd love for them to, to get in touch with you and 
yeah, it was absolutely good fun and and super interesting talking to you. And I wish we could could cover more ground. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. I agree with you. You know, you got to start somewhere, but but I think this applies to any particularly industrialized nation that is seeing more and more inequality. You know, even though you the prosperity seems to grow. Right. Others are, are doing it um, better. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, please have people go to findingcommonpurpose.org where they can find me, email me. And um, thank you for doing this. I think you were doing yeah. a great service by bringing people that really want to think differently about systems together. We we, we need this at, at this time in so many different ways. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon. Take good care. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Shape the System. As usual, if you'd like to suggest a guest, someone that you know who's helped change a system for the better, please go to www.shapethesystem.org, click on the top right-hand corner, then click Suggest Guest. Make sure that you click Subscribe so that you get the new episode. Shape the System is an independent podcast with support from KPMG High Growth Ventures. Connects founders to the services they need along their journey. Whether you are looking to refine your strategy, mature your finance function, prepare for a capital raise, expand abroad, or simply comply with regulatory requirements, they provide you with the support you need to drive your business forward.